It's my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Marshall Preddy. Marshall is Associate General Counsel and Privacy Officer with Lone Star Circle of Care, a federally qualified health center in Central Texas. Prior to moving to Austin in Lone Star Circle of Care, Marshall worked for Houston Methodist. Marshall actually gave a very similar presentation to this one for a Bahaka event last November. The response was so positive that we asked him to present again, and he graciously agreed. So with that, I'll pass the microphone to Marshall. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Marshall Freddy. Um, this is the first time I've actually ever done one of these. I'm sitting in my office at uh, my usual office, and it's a little weird to be talking to everyone without seeing you. Um, so this is not, uh, not something I do regularly, but I'm really excited to be able to talk about some issues that affect organizations that are trying or already doing uh, engaging in sort of in an integrated behavioral health model. That is a, a model of care that includes both uh, behavioral health and physical health care under one organization. Um, I'm going to talk about today a couple of areas I think that come up an awful lot. Today is that I'm going to talk about two issues um, that I think uh, there are some misconceptions about or people don't quite understand the, con the contours of these issues. I, I think we tend to be and I think it's a good thing. We tend to be a little uh, uh, overprotective uh, and, and worried that we will share too much or violate the law. Um, and there are some instances, though, where I think we have construed uh, the protections that people have too broadly. Now, these are important protections, and we need to abide by the law. But I think, especially with respect to a situation where you're trying to integrate and share information between behavioral health providers and other health care providers, um, you want to make sure that you're sharing the information that's necessary to, uh, to enhance care and to provide the benefits that I think we all agree uh, are really important for our patients. So the first area that I'm going to talk about is, is sharing psychotherapy notes in an integrated behavioral health environment. And I think the primary misconception here is just how broad the definition of psychotherapy notes. So if we could if we could advance the slide, please. So I think, and, and I'm hoping this is true, but I, I'm, I'm guessing that a large portion, or maybe all of my all of the audience here today, sort of understands HIPAA, the basic way that HIPAA works. But I'm going to briefly cover uh, some some important rules. The general rule under HIPAA is that no patient authorization is required when covered entities use or disclose protected health information within the entity or disclose PHI um, to another covered entity for treatment, payment, or healthcare operations. So when you're sharing information for those three reasons, treatment, payment, and healthcare operations, um, you don't have to stop and ask for permission from the patient to do that typically. Um, in, a, in an office where you're dealing with all primary care providers, um, there's, there's sort of no hesitation to understand that, hey, I can pick up where my partner left off in seeing this patient because we can view the same notes and we can share the information for the benefit of this patient. Next slide, please. Um, so there are two really big uh, exceptions to HIPAA's sort of treatment, payment, healthcare operations rule. There's actually more than that, but the two I'm going to cover today are psychotherapy notes under HIPAA and then the Part 2 regulation for substance abuse programs. So both of these things, both of these uh, rules, these regulations, uh, apply what I call super protection to traditional PHI. I mean, they go above and beyond the protections of what we would call regular PHI um, and apply uh, rigorous consent requirements, uh, among other regulations, to that information. So they both act sort of to restrict the flow of information uh, for important reasons. Um, but I think what I would like to do today is basically define the scope of those, of those sharing regulations appropriately so that we're not preventing ourselves from sharing important information when we don't have to. Next slide. So let's talk about psychotherapy notes first. 
These are notes that are recorded in any medium by a mental health care provider uh, documenting or analyzing the contents of a conversation during a private counseling session uh, or a group joint or family counseling session and that are separated from the rest of the individual's medical record. That last part is really important. Next slide. Psychotherapy notes do not include medication, prescription, pres medication uh, prescriptions and monitoring, counseling sessions, start and stop times, the modalities and frequencies to treatment. So basically, what we're looking at is psychotherapy notes are what I think are commonly referred to as session notes. Basically, the notes about what a person said during the meeting and the impressions of that discussion. Uh, they're not. They're not these other things that can be that are often uh, uh, included as structured data within an electronic medical record system. Go ahead. So um, the final privacy rule, and this is where we look to to sort of see how this works. And this was the final, the initial final HIPAA, final HIPAA privacy rule that discussed the psychotherapy notes exception has been essentially unchanged. Uh, through through the uh, through all the uh, changes that we've seen in, in HIPAA, um, and that's exactly what they said. These psychotherapy notes are referred to as process notes, um, and these process notes they say are distinguishable from the progress notes or the medical record or the official record. And that goes back to what I said earlier. These these psychotherapy notes are typically kept separate from the medical record. Um, and they are going to capture the impressions about the patient. They're going to contain details of the conversation um, that are considered inappropriate for the medical record and that may be used by the provider for their personal reference in future sessions. So part of the reason they're kept separate is to limit access, uh, even in an electronic system, because they have sensitive information. You want to keep these separate. Um, and they are the notes for that particular provider. They are not going to become part of your general medical record where you're sharing this information uh, with your colleagues so that if you have another colleague come in and treat the same person, they would have access to those records. The whole point of psychotherapy notes is that that's not what they're doing. They are for you alone as the provider and not for, and not for another provider. Next slide. Um, so. They go on to comment, and I think it's. I think this is. We often think about psychotherapy notes as, uh, or at least I've talked to a lot of people, and they think, well, psychotherapy notes are basically those process notes, and no matter where they're recorded. So if you're putting that in the medical record, those are psychotherapy notes, and therefore they are super protected. They can't be shared with anyone, not even with a payer. Um, but uh, they actually address this in, in in the rule. This is one commenter noted that the public mental health system is increasingly being called upon to integrate and coordinate services among other providers and mental health services. And they have developed an integrated electronic medical record system um, that includes psychotherapy notes, and which can be easily modified to provide different levels of confidentiality. But, you know, and another one, another commenter said, well, um, allowing use of disclosure of psychotherapy notes, um, uh, you know, they, they wanted to see that. They wanted to allow this type of information to be shared with other providers within an integrated healthcare facility. Um, and I think we all want to see that. Uh, the question is whether the HIPAA privacy law prohibits that, as I think many people, uh, many people do. They think that that is a prohibited activity. Next slide, please. But the response makes clear that if you are routinely sharing these records with others and actually including these process notes in your medical record, they are, by definition, not psychotherapy notes. So merely by actually including them for the reference of others, for your partners in the practice, whether you're in a, an, integrated, uh, an integrated behavioral health model or not, merely by including them in the medical record and making them part of the same of all the other information in your electronic medical record, that means they're not psychotherapy notes. So to qualify for the definition and increase protection, you have to actually create and maintain those for the use of the provider alone who created them. Um, they are not super protected if you are putting them out there for your colleagues to see the next time they might run into this particular patient. 
So the, just because the subject matter and the nature of, it, of the discussion might be recorded in your medical record, that does not uh, mean that they are psychotherapy notes. Psychotherapy notes are literally, you, you've got your own private notebook and you are uh, recording your thoughts and impressions and the, and the substance of the conversation separately from uh, the, what you are actually inputting into your, uh, into your medical record, electronic medical record or not. Forward. So let's say you do have psychotherapy notes, and that's possible. Uh, even, even, if, uh, even if you do put most of your process notes and you, most of you, what are, what's in your sessions into the electronic medical record, it's entirely possible that you do have these notebooks or that your, your folks at your practice do have notebooks that they use for their own purpose. And that could be an electronic notebook, that could be a paper notebook, it doesn't matter what form it is. If it's only for your use and you're not sharing it with anybody else and putting it into the medical record, that may be considered uh, psychotherapy notes. So um, the HIPAA rules that apply to psychotherapy notes are as follows. You always have to have authorization for sharing them, um, except for these particular situations. Use, you're using them yourself. Um, you're using the, the, the covered entities using them for certain training situations. Um, there's a, you need to use it. You need to use or disclose these notes because you're being sued by that individual. Um, and, and requests from the secretary. A, a few of these are similar to other exceptions, but the point is that it's it's actually it's actually what I would call super protected. There are very there are many fewer uh, uh, situations in which you're going to be able to share this information. Uh, without the patient's authorization. One of the very important ones down there is uh, to prevent or lessen a serious and imminent threat to the health and safety of a person or the public. So these exceptions exist, but you'll notice that treatment, payment, healthcare operations, that's not in here. That's because those, those uh, exceptions allowing the sharing um, uh, of, of regular PHI do not apply. Uh, to psychotherapy notes. Next slide. So another key definite, another key uh, thing to think about is authorization is required if you're going to share with other providers. And that's true even within the same entity. So it's really serious when you say this is for my own personal reference. That's for your own personal reference. You, that, that's, that's not something you're going to be able to bounce off of another provider. If you do, it's not psychotherapy notes. It's something that needs to be part of the medical record. Um, uh, importantly, true psychotherapy notes that you've kept for your own use, there's no access right or obligation to share those with the individual or that individual's legal representative. So an individual, one of your patients, could see everything that's in the medical record. They're going to have they, they're going to have access to that. Uh, barring a few exceptional circumstances, they're going to be able to see the notes that you put in the medical record. They're not going to be able to see the psychotherapy notes, the, the capital P, capital N definition of psychotherapy notes. They're not going to be able to access your private notebook. Um, so um, as I say down here, you can still, even though you put process notes or uh, uh, session notes in the uh, in the, in the electronic medical record for your colleagues to see, you can still refuse to share those mental health records with the patient uh, in particular circumstances if doing so would be harmful to the patient's physical, mental, or emotional health. Uh, I know you guys are familiar with that exception. Uh, that continues to apply even if you're not trying to hang on the psychotherapy notes definition. So you still have that protection. Next. So, so the question becomes, you're setting up an integrated behavioral health model. Is this something you want? So the pros are you don't have to disclose to the individual uh, psych these psychotherapy notes, and it's, it's blanket. It's really strong. You don't even have to do the harm analysis because these notes are, are kept apart. Um, and then you have other robust pr protections under, under, uh, under state and federal law. Um, including uh, protections against disclosing them to payers or disclosing them that you have heightened protection uh, against uh, admissibility in a court of law. So you have these kinds of protections. The cons are you can't share with other providers, even within the same organization. 
So everything you're trying to do with your integrated behavioral health model, uh, being able to share this with uh, other healthcare providers, such as their family practitioner, uh, that you're not going to be able to share th uh, these notes because you've separated them. You're not putting them into the EMR. Um, if you are keeping them in the EMR, and that's a possibility, again, just because you're shoving them in the EMR, that doesn't necessarily mean that they become, that they're not psychotherapy notes, because you can actually create a firewall. So you can say, hey, providers, you can put your psychotherapy notes here. Only you will be able to see them. If you have an EMR that allows for that functionality, those would still be, uh, those would still be considered psychotherapy notes if they are not generally shared with other people and aren't disclosed and you apply all the protections of psychotherapy notes to those, to those uh, notes. Um, but if you're doing that, and understand whether you're doing that as part of your EMR or you have your own separate notebook or whatever, management, security, and compliance are way more difficult if you have providers keeping separate psychotherapy notes in addition to what's in your electronic medical record. Um, uh, so, it's, and that's especially true when they're kept separate. So you've got, let's say you have a provider who um, keeps copious notes on their own laptop. Well, now you've got, in, in, in all your other medical records are stored centrally and it, they're encrypted and they're not stored on the laptop. You really, you could have a security problem there. Um, you want to make sure that laptop's encrypted. You want to make sure it's protected. Um, and, uh, and, and doubly so if you've got a, a notebook lying around and you lose that notebook. So I, I argue that um, that not only does it does having psychotherapy notes uh, be a part of your practice sort of rob you of the benefits of an integrated behavioral health model, um, it also introduces some pretty serious compliance and security risk. Next slide. So. Here, here are my personal recommendations uh, for dealing with psychotherapy notes. The first is avoid creating or maintaining them. I just, I think you can, I think you can entirely avoid uh, the presence of psychotherapy notes in your practice. That you don't have to do that, but like I say, I think things would be a lot easier for you if every time you get a records request, you're not having to consider, okay, do you have separate uh, psychotherapy? Do you have separate notes? Uh, one thing you might have to consider there is, okay, do you have notes in there that might not meet the definition of psychotherapy notes? You, let's say you've got a notebook and you put a bunch of other stuff in there that isn't the process notes. That's an issue. That's stuff that you might have to disclose. Um, so unless you're, put, unless you're also putting it separately into the electronic medical record. So I think you run into a lot of problems if you, if you are systematically keeping these psychotherapy notes um, and separate from your electronic medical record. Uh, Second, unify your VH and medical records and reap the benefits of an integrated model and avoid, you know, the, the, the compliance headaches that I talked about. You can unify your VH and medical records so that your medical providers will be able to review information that you, that you, the behavioral health provider, have input into the system. Um, that's one of the that's one of the benefits of uh, of having this model in the first place. Um, you want to be transparent with patients. This is something that you're going to have to put in your medical, in your uh, notice of privacy practices. Um, you want to tell them not only in your notice, but just be upfront with them when they walk in the door. Look, everything that we talk about or you know that I record in your medical record is going to be part of your medical record. It's going to be available to you. You're going to be able to have access to it. Um, let them know that upfront. Uh, it's going to be in there that w let them know that their other providers uh, at the at the clinic will also be able to see and review those notes, um, and that and that need and again that needs to be part of your notice of privacy practices. In ours, we basically say uh, we we don't we try our very best not to keep psychotherapy notes, um, uh, and you, so you want to update your policies and procedures, and you want to update your notice of privacy practices. You want to maintain, you still want to have appropriate role-based access restrictions in your EMR. So uh, that, that's one of, the, one of the benefits of an EMR versus, say, a paper system is, is the very strong role-based access controls you can implement. Just because you have an integrated behavioral health model uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you want everybody in your practice to be able to view these still very sensitive behavioral health notes and, and process notes. So you want to restrict them appropriately 
only to people and classes of folks who should be who should have access to this. For example, you can say, okay, the MAs aren't going to have access to this. Your front desk folks are going to have access to this. Um, utilize the same the same role-based access restrictions you hopefully already have. Um, and remember that the minimum necessary still applies outside the treatment context. So just because you put them into your medical record, a lot of times those process notes aren't going to meet the minimum necessary. That's not going to be what's needed, for example, when you are disclosing uh, to uh, a payer or when you're or when you're potentially disclosing for for a subpoena. You can still say, hey, we're going to include everything but this and negotiate, for example, with an attorney who's subpoenaing records. Um, th that's still possible. You should, you should still take every opportunity to limit the minimum necessary. And that goes for, let's say you're, you're involved with an HIE. That goes for your HIE as well. Uh, so these might not be things you want to have in a health information exchange. Uh, you, want to, you want to keep your eye out for that. Next. Now, some of you may not have uh, or may not even be considering a, an integrated behavioral health model, but you may be uh, outsourcing to a, be, uh, a behavioral health provider. So you may be contracting with a behavioral health provider. Um, or you may, you may be the behavioral health provider that's contracting with a larger organization. Um, so that's when you want to communicate about whether you maintain uh, psychotherapy notes or whether they're going to maintain psychotherapy notes. Um, you want to consider talking with your contracted BH provider and say, hey, document in our medical record. Uh, that way, even if you're just contracting with someone outside the organization, uh, you can give them access to your medical record uh, and have them provide their documentation there. Um, if there are separate primary and BH uh, medical records, uh, you, you should create clear policies that say, hey, here's the information we're going to routinely share. So even if you aren't uh, if you aren't just automatically sharing that information as part of your as part of it as part of an all-in-one system, uh, you can still create policies that say, "Hey, this is the information we're going to share," and again provide that uh, as part of your notice of privacy practices as well. Um, and, and that and in that situation, you want to make sure that that's in both notices of privacy practices. So you you're the contracted provider; you've got to have a notice. And the contracting organization also has to have a notice that makes clear how you're treating uh, psychotherapy notes and what the definition of psychotherapy notes is. Uh, so if the BH provider uh, does keep uh, information that meets the definition of psychotherapy notes, understand that you as a contracting provider, you're not going to have access to those notes without the patient's authorization. Um, and, and that may be a benefit of the relationship. You might not want to have that access. Uh, it really depends on, 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 on what you're trying to do. Um, but uh, if you are the contractor provider, any notes that you keep separate, that's not going if you, if you, if you provide uh, other information to your contracting provider. That's going to stay with you. Next. All right. So that's a natural time, I, I think. Uh, to to answer some questions and uh, and and let me know if I if I glided over something uh, we can address now. Thank you, Marshall and um, Elizabeth and I are monitoring the the chat box for questions. So if um, you know, if anyone does have a question, uh, go ahead and type it, and we'll um, read those aloud for Marshall. I'm guessing we don't have any outstanding questions. I just just got one actually. Um, this um, there's a question: Can psychotherapy notes remain protected if they are passed along to a colleague upon retirement? Oh wow, that is a good question. Uh, I actually I'm not, I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. I would have to look that up. I would think I, I'll give you my best guess, which is which is. I don't think so, um, unless you unless you're going to get the consent of your patients, uh, because I, I think just based on the sort of structure of the rule, that's the way they're that's the way they're 
that's the way they're built. I mean, you uh, now you, you can normally sell a medical record. That's one of the exceptions for a PHI. You can sell a medical record uh, to a, su a succeeding uh, provider that's taking over your practice, but your psychotherapy notes are specially protected. They are uh, they are limited in in terms of the uh, the exceptions that apply. So you're not going to be able to just hand over all hand over all the notebooks you've kept and hand them over to this new provider who didn't take them, who did who didn't who wasn't there in the session, who didn't participate in the session. So they aren't notes then for your personal use. They're now notes for uh, your succeeding provider's use. I would say no. I mean. I, so I, I'm going to look that up, and I can certainly get back with you and sort of post an, post an answer or whatever, uh, I think. Um, but I'd have to do some research on that. But just off the top of my head and sort of knowing the, how the rules work, I would say no. I don't think you could just hand those, those, uh, those sessions, those uh, private psychotherapy notes, that is your own little notebook, off to the next provider. Thank you, Marshall. And we can certainly um, facilitate, um, if you uh, find more information about that, passing that on to the the person who asked, and, or, and as well question. as to all the attendees. Yeah, I, I, I should look that up. So, um, I'm not getting any other questions right now. Um, we will have time for questions again at the end. Or if you do think of a question as Marshall um, continues to present, feel free to, to type it at that time, and we'll either ask it at that time or um, we'll hold it and ask it um, at the end. So thank you, Marshall. No problem. OK, so now I'm going to talk about another uh, Another regulation um, that involves a sort of super protection, that is additional restrictions over and above your, what I'll call your regular old HIPAA uh, requirements. Uh, again, I'm, I'm assuming that we sort of have a, a, a sort of bedrock understanding of HIPAA, uh, but we can get into particular questions about the interplay between HIPAA and Part 2 uh, if you have those questions, and we'll certainly talk a little bit about that. So, this is another issue that comes up. Uh, substance abuse uh, program information, uh, that's you know, when you're dealing with an integrated behavioral health model. Next slide. So the Part 2 regulation is a separate, entirely separate from HIPAA uh, privacy regulation that protects information that could identify a patient as a substance abuser. Um, what it does is it prohibits any federally assisted substance abuse, uh, substance abuse treatment programs from disclosing without the patient's consent, uh, and we'll talk about consent because the elements are not the same as they are under HIPAA, information that would identify a patient as an alcohol or drug abuser. Um, the, the question inevitably comes up, okay, I have information about uh, you know, patients disclose to me as a behavioral health provider problems they have with, with substance abuse. Does that make that information subject to the Part 2 regulation? And the answer is no, not automatically. You have to actually be a program. Next slide. And um, just, uh, just before you go on, Marshall, um, I, actually, for those of you who aren't getting as high quality sound as um, as you might want, um, try uh, closing any unused applications on your desktop besides uh, GoToTraining. Um, that can actually help sometimes. Th thanks, Marshall. No problem. I'll do that too. Okay. Um. So, oh, no, I'm sorry. Rewind. Sorry? Yeah, rewind. The, the slide got it. Let's see here. Let's see. Did you want? The slide got advanced. There we go. Oh, I have control now. Okay. So, um, you have to be a program. And what is a program? So, a program is an individual or entity or an identified unit of a general medical facility that holds itself out as providing and actually does provide uh, alcohol or drug abuse diagnosis, treatment, or referral for treatment, or medical personnel or other staff in a general medical facility where the primary function is the provision of alcohol or drug abuse diagnosis, 
treatment or referral for treatment and who are identified as sex providers. So there are two things, and I'll rewind, it, I'll rewind it a, a, a bit, just go back to this. So federal assistance, probably almost all of you are going to be federally assisted because federal assistance includes federal assistance of any kind. And that, does, that includes even if you've got a DAA license and you are uh, prescribing uh, 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 substances that uh, uh, aid in substance abuse treatment. But you still have to be a program. So even if you receive some federal assistance, you still have to be a, a program. I'm sorry, next slide. There we go. So you actually have to hold yourself out as providing and provide diagnosis, treatment, or referral for treatment, or you have to have you have to have a personnel or other staff in a general medical care facility where your primary function is the provision of alcohol or drug abuse diagnosis. So this language, I argue, is it's meant to exclude uh, providers for whom substance abuse is, is incidental to your regular practice. Uh, next slide. Okay. So how does part two affect the disclosure of information? So if, you're, if you've got service lines, units, or specific personnel that are primarily concerned with treating substance abuse, like that's what they do all day, every day, or even half their time is spent doing that, um, the sharing of that patient information becomes greatly restricted. Uh, so unlike HIPAA, there's no treatment, payment, or healthcare operations exceptions for disclosures without authorization. Instead, um, to share without patient consent, you either need to be a program that shares administration with that receiving entity, so like you, you're all under the same roof, or you have a qualified service organization agreement that's similar to a BAA. So the first thing you need to do is figure out, you know, is, is one of these, uh, do I have, is either my entire organization a part two organization or do I have parts within my organization that are part of the that are that are covered by these Part Two regulations. Once you know that, then you you've got to you've got to realize that the sharing of that information is now greatly restricted within your organization. Um, if you've got a single provider that all they do is substance abuse treatment, that is a, a hindrance to your that that's not that provider is not really going to be able to participate in your broader integrated behavioral health model their records are going to need to be segregated because you've got to have, uh, because these, these, uh, the super protections begin to apply to information that they develop. So, and to share that information, you've got to be a program that either shares administration with the receiving entity or you've got to have this qualified service organization agreement. Next slide. There we go. So, uh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said next slide. So, when a substance abuse uh, disorder unit is a component of a larger program or general program, uh, the specific information about that patient arising out of that diagnosis, treatment, or referral or treatment, you can exchange that without patient consent among the Part 2 program personnel who, in connection with their duties, need to know the information. That is key. So it, they've actually got to have a, uh, a reason for viewing that information. Um, so if you have that provider, you can share information with, with other providers who, in their connection with their duties, actually need to know that information. So I guess, really, you can still have a sort of integrated behavioral health model there with that person, but you've got to be really smart about how you're sharing that information because it is super protected. So like, you're literally identifying other providers who will also need to view that information. And I think, I think in that situation, especially if you have an electronic medical record, you're going to need to be very proactive about uh, making sure that the only people who can access that information are those types of people, administrative personnel who, in connection with their duties, actually need to know the information. Um, and so if you, are, if you are sharing it with another provider, it's got, they've got to meet this definition of administrative personnel who, in connection with their duties, need to know the other information. So 
The other, the other thing you can do, aside from just having everyone under that one or under the shared administration umbrella, is you can be a qualified service uh, organization. So uh, you you can share information again without patient consent with a another entity that you need to perform certain services like data processing, bill collecting, uh, labs, uh, legal, medical, accounting, those types of services. Um, and then services to prevent or treat child abuse and neglect. Um, so there are, these are pretty specific, by the way. So they're not all, uh, it's not very general like healthcare operations. We're actually dealing with a much smaller, these are things that are actually defined in the regulation. We're dealing with a smaller uh, universe of reasons for which you would need to create a, a quali you would need to have an agreement with a qualified service organization. Um, so if you don't have shared administration, that is, you're not literally like all under the same roof, um, you need to have this, what's called a QSOA, a written agreement that acknowledges, that basically passes on the regulatory burdens under Part 2 to the organization that's performing the services. And this is very, very similar to a business associate agreement or a BAA under HIPAA. So they acknowledge that by receiving, storing, processing, Otherwise, dealing with any patient records from the Part 2 program, you are fully bound by the Part 2 regulations. Um, and that includes that if you get, for example, a subpoena, you're going to resist judicial proceedings, any effort to obtain access to those records, except as permitted under the law. So that's a big, that's not, that is not something that's usually required under a business associate agreement. You are actually, you, that means you've got now two organizations that are working together to resist the disclosure of this information uh, for judicial proceedings. That is a contractual requirement. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I went one two. So, when do you need consent? You're going to need a, a compliant consent similar to HIPAA, except that you've got to have a statement in there that information cannot be redisclosed without consent unless permitted by federal law. That's very different from HIPAA where information actually can be redisclosed. Uh, so there's got to be a statement in that consent that notifies the recipient uh, of the consented information. You can't, even though this person has consented to share the information with you, you are not, you are barred from redisclosing this information to anybody else. So you, so the effect of that is basically this. You want multiple parties to receive the information uh, You've got to have, you've got to name every party that is receiving that information on the consent. And that, that's not necessarily true under HIPAA. So you want to, you've got to have everybody named under that consent in order to share Part 2 covered information with them. Uh, and this is why segmentation of records can be critical. Um, the, this, is, I, this is the difficulty, and I think this is the difficulty for both psychotherapy notes and for Part 2 uh, providers, uh, especially Part 2 providers who are in a larger organization that might not be a Part 2 organization. Um, you really, if you're going to abide by the law, you've probably got to segment those records. Uh, or you've got to do an outstanding job of training your HIM folks so that they're not releasing Part 2 information when they get a general request for records uh, about a patient. Uh, because uh, the super protection applies. So if the payer comes in and they request this information, remember, TPO doesn't apply under Part 2. So just because you're the payer doesn't mean you get Part 2 records. Um, so segmentation of records is critical. If the information can be redisclosed without consent, Part 2 data can't. And the information that you receive from a Part 2 provider, this is important too. This is why if you're going to be, you're going to be dealing with Part 2 organizations, You've also got to segment that information because you can't redisclose it. You've got to have a way of identifying information that you receive from a Part 2 provider subject to a, a, a QSOA. Uh, otherwise, uh, you're probably going to redisclose that information uh, inappropriately. Um, so that's, that's the challenge in sort of the integrated behavioral health model is dealing with these electronic health records that are sort of blunt tools. They don't really have sophisticated segmentation capabilities typically um, so that you can flag, for example, certain information at certain encounters. A lot of EMRs don't have that kind of capability. 
So you really need to think about it. Am I going to accept uh, Part 2 covered information into my organization and the compliance uh, headaches that come along with that? If you've got psychotherapy notes, the same questions are going to, you're going to, especially psychotherapy notes that you're going to say, these will be walled off within an area in our EMR. How are you going to manage that? How are you going to technologically manage that? Uh, those are the kinds of questions that this super protected information raises in your organization. You've got to figure out how you're going to manage the compliance risks that come along with having that type of information in your organization. Um, this is an important question. Are you a Part 2 program? We talked about that earlier. You've got to analyze your service really carefully. Do you receive federal assistance? As I said, this includes even private pay clinicians. Like you, could, you could go completely without any other assistance. Uh, uh, but if you use controlled substances uh, for detoxification or maintenance treatment, uh, uh, and, and you have the, you obviously have the DEA license to do that, uh, that means that's a, that's a, that meets the definition of federal assistance. Um, do you advertise or characterize your services as substance abuse treatment or referrals? Is that the way you're holding yourself out? Uh, and, and not just you as an organization, but s specific parts of your organization. If you have particular providers that say, hey, this is what we do. I'm a substance abuse counselor, and that's my job. That person's records are all, are all part two regulations, if that's the way you're holding yourself out. Um, do you notify other providers? Hey, I can receive these referrals. I am a substance abuse treatment provider. You can refer those, those patients to me. Again, you're holding yourself out. Um, and, and do you have providers who primarily treat such cases? Um, those are the questions you have. I mean, some of these, some organizations, they don't have a problem identifying this because they know for sure we are a program. We are a, we are a public or a private substance abuse treatment program that receives federal dollars. We know that, we're, that that's what we do. We're in that business. Other organizations like you're a, you're a federally qualified healthcare center, you're a clinic, you have providers who actually do some of this stuff that's when you get into saying, well, is that provider a part two, is that provider now a part two program? Do they meet the threshold? Is that what if they only have one or two patients that they're dealing with? Does that meet the threshold? Those are the kinds of questions that you really have to ask. And and notice that I'm a lawyer, but I'm not you know I'm not I, I'm not offering you guys a legal uh, answer to that question because it's so incredibly fact specific to your organization. Uh, you've got to decide, do we meet the threshold here um, and, and figure that out for your organization. Certainly, I say, if you are, if you've got people who everything that they do, or even half of what they do, is treating substance abuse cases, that's probably part two information. Uh, if you're telling other people, you're a provider, I'm a substance abuse provider, I see primarily substance abuse patients, that you are bringing yourself under the umbrella of the Part 2 program. Um, you can have a unit that's dedicated to this. You can be a particular provider that's dedicated to this. But the point is, you really need to identify those folks in your organization or, or identify whether you, your, your entire organization is, is one of those. Especially if, if, you, if half of, your, if half of your, your folks meet that definition and you really can't segregate them as a particular unit of your organization, um, you, you might be dealing with your entire organization is now a part two organization, and you and you have to treat that information, all information in your electronic medical record, as part two information. That's that's a that's something that you guys that you really have to decide once you're aware of these part two regulations and how they work. Next slide. Um, I've just had a, a, question, a question come up yeah. that this might be a good time to ask it. Um, this, yeah. is a, this is a question about how Part 2 interacts with the regional health information exchanges. Um, for instance, mm -hmm. what, what sort of permissions are needed to disclose Part 2 information from an inpatient facility to an outpatient facility upon discharge if both facilities are part of that health information exchange? Do, do they, does the other provider still have to be named on a consent form? Yes, they do. Um, that's really important, and, uh, and I've worked with, with the integrated care collaboration 
uh, in Austin, and that's the regional HIE here in Central Texas, uh, on this very issue. Um, you have to have, when you have a consent to share information, and that consent can include substance abuse information, it's got to name specifically in advance every provider that's doing that. What that means for a regional health information exchange is you can, in advance, say, okay, do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to share this information through the exchange, but then that patient is going to have to sign an authorization allowing that information to be shared with each and every member of that, of that health information exchange. Uh, that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is, is to wall off that information, to segregate that information in the exchange. Uh, and I know that that's what the ICC has done. So, so uh, the Part 2 information is not generally shared with other members of the, of the health information exchange uh, because that's kind of difficult. You're, you're constantly adding members or subtracting members who can participate in the exchange. So if you add one member and they're not on the, and they're not on the initial consent form, now you've got to redo your consent form and send it back out to everyone. That's very, very difficult to do. Uh, so instead, what, you, what we have is that information might be sent to the regional, uh, to the health information exchange itself through a QSOA, but it's not shared with the other members uh, unless there is a specific consent allowing it to be shared with the HIE. Thank you. Uh, or allowing it to be shared with the ultimate, the ultimate other party. So the way you would do that is say, okay, I want to share. Party A shares with the regional health information exchange. Party B receives that information after an off from the from the health information exchange after a specific authorization is signed. That's the way that would work. Thank you. Okay. So if you have part two units or providers, your model is really important. Okay. Are you uh, a fully integrated with shared administration? There you can. Uh, you can, uh, you may be able to share that information, but you need to be careful, I think. So you can share that information with other providers, but understand that to the extent that you're not segregating the, the part two information, if it's making its way into other records, uh, that could convert that information from merely being HIPAA protected information to being part two covered information. And now you've got to apply that whole universe of laws to a broader set of information. So you need to be careful when you decide, hey, who are we going to share information with, uh, part two information with, I would argue you almost want to segregate that information and limit it uh, to other people who are going to also create part two covered information. So you want to have a unit probably within your organization where that information is being shared. If it's being shared broadly within your organization, that as may be necessary, you might be, you, your whole organization is probably a part two organization, uh, if that makes sense. So uh, you can also sort of manage this complexity by partnering or contracting for this substance abuse information, substance abuse uh, treatment, uh, uh, including you can say you contract with a VH, you're contracting for VH services. You need to be upfront with them. Hey, are you a are you a uh, are you a part two provider or not? That's a big question when you're contracting for VH services because that limits the information that you're going to be allowed. Uh, you're probably going to need uh, a QSOA that structures how that information is going to be shared and what information is going to be shared. And remember that if you're partnering or contracting for, for BH services, that include part two services. Uh, even if you're getting information, say you're the contracting organization, you might be getting information from the substance abuse provider, but you cannot redisclose that information to anybody else. And I would argue you probably want to avoid including that information in your own medical record. Again, you'd be converting your medical record to a part two medical record. So I think that's really necessary uh, because the, re the disclosure and redisclosure rules are highly restricted. If you're mixing that information up, you're not going to be able to manage the, the redisclosure problems. Um, and you're going to need policies or, and technical access controls that prevent unauthorized access and disclosure. Uh, also, you want to remember that Part two information is still covered by HIPAA. So you, if you've got a part two uh, provider, you're going to want to mention that in your notice of privacy practices and describe how, how you are taking extra, how you are protecting that part two covered information. Um, uh, also, just in terms of setting this up, setting up your model, doing your, uh, uh, setting up, you know, 
entering into QSOAs uh, and uh, deciding how information is going to be shared, setting your policies and procedures, and really figuring out whether you're a Part 2 provider. Seek legal counsel. Find a lawyer who's sort of conversant in this and, and rely, on their, rely on their advice uh, because it's not an area where you want to where you want to mess up. Hmm. Next slide. So now, um, I think we 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 certainly have um, a little bit of time for que for questions. Um, if anybody else has a question um, that they um, can type in, um, we can pass that on to Marshall. And you may also be able to unmute yourself um, individually and and ask the question aloud. Unmuted. Unmuted. I think what happened there is with uh, 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 unmuting, um, several people did that, and then too much, uh, too much static and background noise came through. So we m maybe we need to stick to the chat box after all. Oh, okay. I see, I see some questions. I'm sorry. I, you see I'm, some? I'm, okay. I'm, I'm not realizing. I should probably answer these questions that are being asked. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I hadn't seen it one either. Yeah, so let me um, read this aloud for everyone. Um, oh, so another, this is a follow-up question on the question about the health information exchange. Um, does it make any difference if it is a federated health information exchange versus a consolidated one? Uh, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Um, uh, well, I, I take that back. It does in the sense that, you, you, for example, the ICC is, is a centralized data repository. So you're going to need what's called a QSOA to share information with the regional health information exchange. You're going to have to have that in place. Um, but in terms of the specific consent requirements, that's not going to change. You're actually still going to need to have consent for, any, for anyone who's receiving that, and then that information cannot be redisclosed so by, the, by whoever receives it. So all of that would be the same. You've got to, like I say, you can do it. You can share through a, through a regional health information exchange, but the Part 2 consent requirements are going to apply. And you you're going to have to, the, the, uh, the receiving entity is going to have to be specifically named. Thank you. And uh, again, connected to the, the health information exchanges, we have a question. Can the form request a release to relevant members of the exchange, but without listing each individual entity? I, I guess I don't know how you would identify the relevant members of the exchange without actually listing the, 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 each entity. So, um, the way I read the rule is you actually have to have it on the form. It has to be really, really transparent to the person who is authorizing the release that they have to be named on the form. So I guess you're asking, well, could you say, hey, here's a, here's a defined group of people who will receive substance abuse information, and you can see that on our website. Uh, I would say no, that that's not, mm -hmm. not going to work. You actually have to list each of the entities. And actually, a little further information about that question. For example, a f if a form can just say that it allows release to members of the identified exchange. Right. No, so we we actually looked into that when we were conducting our when we were doing our own because that's how that's how you typically do a health if you're doing an opt in, for example. Uh, and this is a good time. I mean, I don't know how how many of you are are, are familiar with HIEs, but HIEs might have an opt in model where. You, patients are specifically required to consent in, you would have to have an opt-in model if you were sharing uh, substance abuse information. The opt-out model wouldn't work because you're never going to share that information uh, where, where you're not upfront requiring that consent. Um, uh, but 
you've got to actually list them on the form. It's not going to work to say, okay, here's a list of them. You can go view it on our website. That doesn't work. You have to actually list them. Uh, of the, uh, you can't just say, hey, look at our website and see who's on it. Thank you. I have another question. This goes back to um, psychotherapy notes. Um, the question is, does a clinical supervisor have the right to read the psychotherapy notes of the provider? Uh, no. No, I would not think so. I mean, that's not one of the, that's not one of the, uh, uh, that's not one of the exceptions. So, there are limited exceptions. Uh, if you are, if you're, if you are, if you've got that information, just mere oversight. Now, for certain training purposes, uh, there might be certain training situations. Yeah, exactly. There might be training situations where that would be uh, potentially permitted. But just a general rule that the supervisor has access to those notes, I'd say no. Yeah. Thank you. And um, a question that I can answer, um, if whether this is going to be available. Um, yes, we will be posting both a PDF of the slides as well as a recording um, of the webinar, and we'll send the information out to everybody about where to access that. Um, I do have another question. Um, is there any uh, resource, website, um, or publication that um, you can recommend where uh, folks might obtain additional information on these topics? There's actually one pretty good one, and I will see you. And if you, you can all, if you'd like, um, if it's easier, you can send that to, to me, and we'll, we'll, we'll both post a link to that and send okay. that out to, the, to everyone who participated. Okay, yeah, I can do that. Great. And then I think, um, I think those are all the, the existing questions. Um, So. Oh, I, I, I guess I can take a moment to sort of to sort of talk about um, contracting. I think that that's an issue that that came up a little bit more in the last session than it's come up in this one. But you, let's say you're a part two. There, I guess there are two situations I want to talk about. You are a uh, uh, organization that's a part two covered organization, and you're contracting with other folks to. Uh, to perform certain services, what does that agreement have to look like, um, uh, and what do those services look like? I mean, some of them are pretty. Like, let's say you've got an outside lawyer, for example, who and, you, and you're working on a case uh, that maybe involves uh, one of the part two patients. That's a situation where you would have one of these QSOAs, and you could share that information um, without patient authorization. Uh, you've got a, another company that's doing your billing. That's a situation where you can have this, what's called a QSOA. And I want to make clear something that I probably should have made clear in the slides. Your QSOA can also be a business associate agreement. You can actually make that the same agreement. It doesn't have to be a separate agreement. It's as long as they have the, 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 the same uh, information. What you're talking about when you talk about a qualified service organization is really a definition under Part 2 that limits who can, how, you know, what type of, of company you're dealing with. But they're going to be some of the same organizations that you have at your business associates. They're going to be these folks that are uh, 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 doing services on on your behalf that it makes sense you probably wouldn't do yourself. So, like for example, billing is a classic example. Legal services, those types of things, labs, testing, things like that. Um, if you're sharing part two information with for services like that, you then you need to have a qualified service. Uh, organization agreement. Now, one question that came up in the last meeting, um, and let me see if I can state it correctly, was what if you are an organization uh, that, is a, that is a part two organization and you're the one being contracted with by the organization that's actually paying you to see these patients? Well, what does your information sharing look like now? How are you going to share information back with them because you can't share information just for treatment, payment, and healthcare operations. Those umbrella things don't apply uh, when you're talking about uh, sharing information back with your contracting organization. And that's absolutely true. What you need to have in place is a QSOA with, your, with that organization that covers, A, why you're sharing the information, for what reasons, and B, how you're going to share that information and restrictions that are going to apply. So you still need, even though you're the one performing the service, 
you still need a QSOA that defines your relationship with the contracting organization. Any questions about that? Thank you. And I don't, we're, or not, we don't have any more questions at this time. Um, we did have a question that you referenced the, the last meeting and um, that Marshall actually gave um, this same information, uh, the, the same presentation at that last meeting in November. Um, so you received the same information today. The exact same slides, right? Yeah, these are the yeah. same exact slides. It was just so well received um, that we wanted to offer it again and to have it on, in webinar format for, um, for others to view. So, so if there are no more questions at this time, um, I'd like to um, give a huge thanks to Marshall Preddy for sharing his time and expertise with us today. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today and for um, putting up with the technical um, difficulties that we had. As uh, the webinar ends, you'll be immediately directed to a brief evaluation. And we would greatly appreciate your taking a few minutes to fill it out now. We do log and um, consider all of those and take them quite seriously. Or if you don't have right time right now in the next day or so um, when it comes to you via email. And as, again, as soon as the recording of the webinar is available, we'll send you information about how to access it. So thank you, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your day and the weekend. Thank you.